Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We would like to start the third session under the special session co-organized by the Japan Foundation Asia Center and the Mori Art Museum. Art into the society is the theme for this session. May, may I introduce the speakers for this session? The director for Design and Creative Business Development Department from Thai, uh, the Creative and Design Center, Mr. Kitiratana Piti Panich. Media artist and director of the HONF Foundation, uh, Mr. Venza Christ. Artist, the director for Hodea Project Ho Chi Minh. And uh, the, uh, the senior, uh, the lecturer, uh, the four or the uh, university, uh, Mr. Richard the Strike Matter Tran, and the moderator for the session is uh, from TEDx Taipei, the co-founder and uh, the founder Maker Bar, Mr. Jason Su, please. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the last session of the uh, today's forum. Uh, I'm very happy and uh, privileged to introduce the speakers of this session as well as moderate the panel. Uh, this session is called Art into the City. Um, as we've progressed all day to talk about art and the future of cities, and this session we'll be looking into some of the specific examples of art becoming part of our daily life and actually become the elements of co-creation. Uh, I'm very, very delighted to introduce our first speaker, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Kiriram Rang um, Pinanich is an old friend. Uh, he is the uh, director for Thailand's Creative Center. I have known him since uh, 2000. 11, when I visited uh, Thailand for, for the first time and visited the design center. And I was struck by his vision to create a design center on the top floor of mall. Uh, his vision was to make uh, design available to general public, even for shoppers who are going there to shop for clothes. Uh, he wanted design to be um, not as something special, but can be encountered by randomness and uh, daily life. Uh, in his talk, he will be introducing projects of co-creation uh, and then several other projects, including uh, high-speed trend design and uh, several other interesting things. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, give it up for Mr. Kidarang Pinahaj. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you, Japan Foundation, Mori Museum, and also Dr. Apinan for inviting me here to represent uh, our center and Thailand, of course. Um, on the screen, please. First of all, today I'm going to speak about a, a, few, a few points, but um, even it's a few points, but I have 24 slides to go in 20 minutes. So I'm going to be very quick, and so be with us. Uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce a bit about TCDC. This is actually um, established by the um, Office of the Prime Minister. We are government. And um, it's been like almost 10 years already. Um, at TCDC, we're doing so many things. Um, exhibitions, uh, library. We have one of the biggest um, uh, design and creative related books, arts, uh, in Southeast Asia. And it's ex expanding every day. We can organize events. You know him, right? We invite many people to our center to expand our knowledge and to share and exchange ideas with uh, international all year long. And not only we work in Bangkok, but we, we also expand to other provinces around Thailand. Right now, we have 14 TCDC, mini TCDC around the country. And it's one of my, our projects that we're going to tell you later on. First of all, of course, we are in the creative economy already. And not recently, but for some times already. 
And when we talk about the creative economy, we cannot avoid the issue of creative city because only the creative city size will realize the policy that might create it from the, the creative economy itself. And when we talk about both issues, it becomes more and more similar. I mean, policy making, realizing the ideas into business, so on and, and so forth. And, but the key point is, in order to have creative economy, creative cities, culture is the key to everything. Among these four elements, labor, capital, government, and culture, of course you have labor, where right? you have people, you have money, you have government policy, but at the end of the day, the culture, the culture, I'm, I'm not talking about only the, the, typical, uh, uh, the typical kind of traditional culture, but um, the work culture, the mentality, to push everything up, to move on, to move forward to the future. That kind of mentality will move everything, will make everything work, and that's so critical. What they call ecology. Creative ecology is the only key to move us from creative economy to creative city and got the, the whole things works. Because it's basically, we have more complex problem nowadays. We need more people. You need to work a lot more with other people. Disciplines, you know, problems and stuff. And when you work together, the question remains, what kind of tools that you need? What kind of skill that you need to, that you need to know to? And still, it's a question. So, in the big picture, I show you this. You have creative core, which is, of course, the creative people, artists, by training, and you have entrepreneurs. These two rings got to work together in order to come up with a creative e economy. But the secret, as I mentioned, we need the e e ecological system, a right kind of ecological system to make everything work, to make everything learn and, you know, and functions. So, picture this. We have people, you know, scale up in individual. We have a group of people, community, organization, government, district level, institution level, local government, central government. You need to have the right kind of ecology. Everything got to be connected. And with the, the word co-creation, is one of the key elements that will make things work. This is, I think, one of the most important ways to make things happen, to make the space where the users become creators. I will explain more through my slides. We use a methodology of service design and co-creation um, to, to, to create this what so-called the, the, the ecology by, by turning a user into a creator. But first of all, what is service, right? It's been so long that we more focus on the product part. But in the reality, 70% of the GDP based on the service. Even Thailand, right? Thailand is probably around 55% um, or so in their service. But again, um, we, Many, many times uh, we didn't pay attention too much on to this. We, we pay more on the ability of the individual, but not like people. And when we talk about the people, we talk about customers, users, different kinds, different age. How can we make sure we, we totally understand them, right? And the service, when you talk about service, the one is measurable. Service, the experience, is also is, is measurable. Through what? Efficiency, you know, effective. It should be usable. People should be satisfied with the things, the impressed with the things. And at the end, it should be desirable for other people. How can we come up with such a thing? Through this process of exploration, um, creation, and then implementation. I explain more through my projects. Um, mostly, we start with making people to interact with each other. This is the project that we did with the Babung Rat Hospital, one of the most expensive hospitals in Thailand. Uh, we work with the, the, the doctors, and we make them, the doctors, 
nerds, technicians, patients, working all together, brainstorming, body storming, all kinds of, tech, of, of techniques. But the key element is this. It should be fun. That is the key when, when we want to learn from people, we, when we want to be able to, 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 to express what they want. Fun is the key element that we always, you know, we cannot be really serious and expect people to express themselves, right? So we make it fun, always. So this only is the only way to, to get information from people. So they start to interact with each other and engaging, having fun, laugh. But at the end, we have information to design a new kind of service. We have stakeholder mapping, all kinds of techniques. I'm not going to go into the, the detail. But um, throughout this uh, process, we have, we learn, we really learn what people really need at the end. I mean, among everyone. And this is another project from the workshop too. Uh, that's the previous one is the most expensive one. This is one, the cheapest, I mean, le least expensive hospital in Thailand. It's Ban Pao Hospital. So this is totally different. We work with the um, eye section, the, uh, the eye clinic. And this section is just filled with people, that the elderly, you know, are impaired, uh, cannot see clear, uh, clearly. And you know how, how much time that they've been waiting in the space in order to be served? Six hours, at least. People got to get up when, you know, at four o'clock in the morning to get the first queue. My God. And it's getting worse. You're talking about 200 to 300 unhappy people, and each one got three to six hours waiting time. So in total, you have what? 1,950 wasting times every day. So how, how can we fix it? Right? We're not going to do like a nice design to fix everything. It's about process. So at the end, um, we come up with the idea from the eye care clinics, which um, we change it to we care. At the eye, the eye care, we're focusing on eyes, but the we care, we're focusing on you. Active player from the eye care is actually you, right? But when, when, when we can, we talk about us, everyone. So it's about you and us co-creating the space. We start investigating what's the problem, prioritize the problem, and we come up with the idea, care flower. Care flower is what? Because we, imagine you have old people, eye impaired, cannot really see clearly, and many of them cannot even read. And many times they just come by themselves. No assistant, no, no children or relatives around, just themselves, right? So this care flower will be introduced to each one of them. You know, when you first arrive, the nurse come, greeting, put the, the care flower, and care flower actually indicate the system, the process they have to go through. And when we talk the process that we have to go through, it's so sophisticated. Imagine you have eye impaired, cannot read sometimes, and, pro and, and process so sophisticated. My God. So this thing makes it very simple. With the leaves, you know, of, of, of the flower, it indicates each process. When you go through, people will take it off one by one. And you know, you, no one left alone, or no one left out of the process unregistered, unattended. Another idea, the health corner, because we're talking about poor people with less, with less money, but need a healthy food. How, can, how, how that's possible? So we invented the idea, come up with a, a food corner, with a donate money, you know, volunteer to help. So this kind of system, we invent, we're, not, we're not inventing, we're not designing anything. But we invent the process to take care of the people by co-creating with nurse and doctors and technicians, as I told earlier. Later on, we expand the impact because uh, we, we did some pilots, right? So we organized, we, we host the events called Bangkok Public Service Jam because we know in order to impact millions of lives at once, you need to work with the government. Government is the major one in the field that can really impact on the people. So invite them to join the, the event called Public Service Jam, which is a part of the global government jams around the world. Uh, just last June, we invite uh, government officials, we invite designers, experts, citizens, in the same workshop. And they're co-creating solutions for the society to improve the quality of life. Together, this, this is the only way, believe me. And then, as I told you earlier, we have 14 minutes TCDC around the country. We also expand the knowledge and train them, 
the teacher and the students to, for, to learn about this, this process. And look at that, they're having fun. Role playing is one of, of the techniques that we use to prototype the service, to actually let them experience what can happen from their ideas. And afterwards, they went out. After they know the skills and knowledge and tools and stuff, they went out to, to explore and even do the body storming, trying all kinds of the service, and, I mean the public service, and come up with the idea. This is one of the, the good solutions that we had from, from the, the um, workshop. They reinvent the root of the, 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 I'm not sure how to call it, but it's um, almost like a mini bus, right? But it's very in, informal way. If you get on, no one tells you where, 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 where you are. So how can you know uh, what is the stop, right? You got no one to ask, only the driver. The driver got to drive and then collecting money, do, do all the, the stuff. So the student reinvent the way to provide information to the guests, to the, 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 the audience. This is one another interesting project from this workshop. Uh, this Gao Seng community is in the southern part of, of Thailand. Um, as you see in, in the picture, they're pretty poor, right? With the kids, you know, garbage. So we're anal uh, analyzing the problems, and then uh, we see that it's so difficult to change anything. It was that like mafia and you know, people taking benefit from this uh, community. So we change our mind instead of you know looking at the, the opinion leader or the, the, the leader of the community, we focusing on kids. Because actually, kids is the, 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 the one who can easily accept the, the change. So we work with them, what kind of stuff they're doing daily, and we reinvent um, a system to really engage the kids in the process of garbage management. Think about it, garbage management by kids. We even invent tools that used to be a kid's toy, I mean, that, but can collect the garbage. I mean, starting with kids, and then the adults keep start to come to the process too. So we're talking about the first step, building the first step. I think that I call creating with the villagers. So we, we're still working on this project. Applying the same kind of methods. In 2010, we have a big flood in, in Thailand. This is a bit of a quick story. People are scared of the water because you never know, this might show up in front of your house. This creature, the crocodiles, right? It's quite scary because we have so many crocodile farms in, in, in Thailand. So people got scared and decide, question, the, the question comes, to move out of the house or to stay? Many decide to, to, to stay and also many decide to move out. The one who stays starts to invent. And then after a week of the flood, this happens. They start to enjoy. See, when, you have, you, when you're having fun, creativity works, right? People start, you know, sunbathing, having a party, right on the water. They're having fun. They even have that, see? You normally see in, in, in the park, right? But it's, it's not a Photoshop. Trust me, that's not a Photoshop. It's real. People start to invent. We talk, when we're talking about the, in, the, in, the invention, we're not talking about designers. Here I'm talking about normal kind of people, kids, villagers, start to survive, right? But while they're surviving, they're also creating something new. During the flood, there are so many pe people die of electrical leakage. So uh, there are many institutions um, comes up with the dark first. So it begins with the dark. Uh, this thing, to test whether they have uh, uh, electrical leakage in, in the water or not. But a week passed, people are still dying because of even using these methods, right? So there's a new study comes up by the engineering department. They found out that when the electrical leak into the water, it's not on the surface. It also goes down to the bottom. So in order to make sure there's no electrical leakage, you need to create, to, to redesign a stick that actually you have to stick into the bottom of, of the ground in order to make sure there's not another thing. And there's a volunteers to make. So you, you, you start to see the process of co-creation happening here. 
I can say, is a crisis-driven in, in innovation by using um, co-creation process. Yes, and yes, you were not wrong. This is a table that turns into a boat during that time. All kinds of innovation is transportation design by people, toilet design by the people, even fashion design by the people. So as a um, design center, we cannot stay still, right? As an institution, as a government, we have to do something. So we, 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 we start to, to create a new kind of platform for people to share their ideas. So we invent, so we create this project, a design for flood, gathering all kinds of information by ourselves. I myself went to the flood and you know, talked to people, hundreds of, of people to get the insight, what kind of problem, what kind of things that they might need first. And from the, the gathering of information, exploration, we come up with 10 ideas that people really need during the flood. Ideas like water monitoring system, public toilet, you know, disease diagnosis kit. You don't even know when, when you get sick because some disease is so similar to like coal, right? But it could, when, when it goes bad, you can die of it too. Water garbage picker, all kinds of stuff. This is just some, and we realize it with, we work with the designers and experts to come up with the innovation, really happen. Floating toilet, this is also, because at that time, clean water also very critical. And maybe some people got it by themselves because they're richer. And some poorer people don't have the, the fil filtration machine, so they have to buy or, or waiting for the donation. So this one is the pub, a public one. It needs, it's, it's more like an exercise machine. You, you see the paddle on both sides, right? People, we need two people to get up and put the water up, up there and to press and start filtering the water. So this is called creation process as well as a community filter water supply. And during the flood, we lost so many tables and chairs from the schools. And, people, and after the flood, students don't have a place to, to study. So this is one of the things that we want is floating tables that can reassemble as like a floating pathway and all kinds of stuff by using the, 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 the plastic. And afterwards, we're going further. Uh, we, we work with, of, of course, with the support of Japan Foundation and uh, Japanese artists. We call curated an exhibition called Always Prepare Living with Changes. This is the exhibition at our center during the, uh, after the flood. So we exhibit the way people survive and you know, the technique and the stuff along with the Japanese designer. And this is one last one. Using the same kind of methods and we come at the end that um, in order to impact millions of lives, we want to change the government first. So, so that's why we work with the Ministry of Transportation uh, to decide if we, are, if we are about to have a future high-speed train of, of our own, what kind of service we're gonna have, all right? So we work, uh, we work with the office live work in London, along with TCDC, we it, it investigate uh, talking to um, hundreds of people, Thai, foreigners, and you know, all kinds of people. And then we come up with uh, 10 starting points for design. Things like safety first is not so difficult. Uh, I can explain. If you talk about safety, and when you see people, I mean, you still see the policemen with the arms, guns, big guns, you don't feel safe, right? You're even more scared with people do, are doing that. So be, uh, so safety first is, is go deeper into the mind of the mentality that you have to recreate. The, the last one, it has to contribute to the local, social, and economic growth. What kind of design, what kind of elements, what kind of urban change gonna happen around the, the, the train station? So this will govern everything around the high-speed train if we have. So, um, I finished 24 slides. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Kitty, for the uh, 
wonderful and a fantastic speech. Um, I like your last slide. If you follow all the rules, you miss the fun. Uh, definitely, our next speaker doesn't follow rules, and uh, he—I'm sure—he's a lot of fun. Um, it's 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 a privilege and honor to introduce uh, Vinza Christ as our next uh, speaker, and uh, um, he is cool. He is very cool. Um, he, uh, in addition to all the interesting projects he's doing, which is normal, but um, he is also a specialist in UFO and aliens, and um, uh, he's been studying UFO and aliens since uh, late 1990s, and um, this is probably his real job, we, we don't know. <laughs> but uh, apart from study of uh, aliens and uh, extra um, celestial uh, beings, he's actually the director of Humph Foundation, and uh, he'll explain to you what Humph means. But Humph, uh, in essence, is actually a maker space that gathers hackers, programmers, and uh, idea generators. Um, it's uh, uh, gatherings for science, technology, and DIY uh, passionate people. And also it becomes a uh, budding ground for ideas in the community. And um, Vinsa also uh, creates this very provocative and very interesting forum, which he just launched this year. It's called Open Culture and the Critical Making. And apparently we looked at the world uh, a lot about being open and being innovative, as well as the maker movement. But he took a step further and uh, taking it to understanding what exactly this maker movement is taking us to and creating what I call a meaningful making. Um, so, uh, it's my privilege to introduce you to the cool speaker, Vinza Christ. Hello, everybody. Name me Descartes. Are you sleepy? Okay. Um, konnichiwa. My Hello. Vinsa. I'm from uh, Hon Foundation, based in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. And uh, Hon is a platform for the open community, and everybody can come and join and produce things uh, depending of the their ideas or their uh, backgrounds related with a uh, creative community and a thousand of uh, group and. Uh, communities uh, in uh, Yogyakarta or in other cities in Indonesia. So Horn Foundation is just one of them. It's not only one uh, creative community in Indonesia, but if you come to Indonesia and jump around the cities and uh, other islands also, you will be really um, excited with a lot of uh, problematic in the society and uh, how we can survive and find a solution. So um, I will start with the music first to, for you to imagine something about the Indonesia. Oh, Indonesia, non-conformity in my inner self. There's a whole thing connected to Brazil and where I'm from that's so connected to third world lyrics because this is this is their lyric when I'm singing about inner self of yeah. growing up in these fucked up streets and shit. The Indonesian fans reading some of those lyrics, they, they feel connected to it. The Pulto are coming from the third country as well and Indonesia with poor injustice everywhere, starving people, you know, the corruption. They're singing about that too in their lyrics. You know, it's uh, some match with what happened in this country all over the years. 
halfway to the show, the, the kid got so crazy. Fucking place, chaos, man, hell, broke loose in the mosh pit. A couple minutes after that, they stopped the entire show and had these huge bamboo sticks. And they were like kind of beating like the first row of kids. And they made 20,000 people sit down on the floor without making one sound. You know, it's like, I never seen anything like that in my life. You know, it was like, none of us, man. I, I think we're like, holy shit. We're playing for the first time ever here. We're so fucking proud to be playing for front of you. I'm sorry for everything that happened tonight. It's a lot similar. The kids in Brazil or in, or in Eastern Europe, rebellion, fucking pissed off. Real pissed off about the shit, the way the life is, is how they, they had to, you know, they grow up in this shithole and pretty much gonna die in this shithole. So what do you do about it? You know, so metal comes in. So yeah, this is just one of the example what happened in 1992. And now it's uh, already 22 years from uh, this event in Surabaya what, uh, in 1992. And the condition, uh, it's not pretty much different. It's still the same. So who in this room is still believe about the future? The future is uh, become positive and become a better life, or in another hand, it's become worse and worse. Because in Indonesia situation, the crisis of the economy, the crisis of the metal, the crisis of uh, many things, uh, natural resources, and uh, of course, uh, the main problem of uh, deforestation and mining exploration is become worse and worse, uh, including now in the political situation. So now I just uh, want to introduce our uh, institution. It's called Horn Foundation. It's become foundation since uh, 2011, and we start in 1999. And now we have a three platform for the open uh, culture and open community. One is called FUFOX, an, an extraterrestrial study center. And this is uh, for people who are working in the pure science and trying to find something or trying to find a solution in the real society. Who is society? Society is us. Society is you. So it's not uh, become radically have a distance between the creator, artist, and the society itself, because the, all the creator is also the society. And the second one is Horn Fab Lab. It's uh, running since 2011 also. It's the first Fab Lab in Southeast Asia. And the third one is Horn Factory, uh, working with the discourse and media studies. And also we have also a uh, hundred of uh, project uh, and uh, as Jason explained before that we uh, also launched the new platform for the open culture and critical making. And every year also we uh, organize uh, sales button the media art uh, festival.
cut uh, the video because the time is only 20 minutes. And now uh, another example also uh, in 2012, we, we launched a project is called Micronation Macronation, uh, democratizing the energy. And we're trying to find the solution how to produce the ethanol as an alternative energy from the hay or the straw from the rice. Because why? Because Indonesia have more than 11 million hectares of rice field. And the straw is they just burn on the field. And only less than 5% uh, they uh, go to feeding cow or uh, burnt to making a ceramic and so on. So uh, with some scientists from the real university, uh, the crazy professor or crazy hackers uh, in around uh, Yogyakarta area, that we collect uh, almost 100 people working from uh, biotechnology staff and uh, hackers to create the combination how to find the solution about the crisis of the energy. And uh, we also built the small uh, earth station to catch the data from the our own satellite. So we hack not satellite from other countries because it's not allowed and we have an ethic to do that. And uh, we hack our own satellite. And then uh, we make the mobile lab, the one that uh, the symbolic of the car. And then from the satellite, the symbolic of the parabola is the, the small earth station and then go to the supercomputer uh, and then analyze the data. So this kind of things is really important how to engage the real society and how artists can do, how the hackers can do, how the creative people can do in the real society. It's not only uh, make a theoretical or just collect the people to do discussion. It's not help. It's not help at all in the Indonesian situation. So I will have the, this is the how to imagine the simulation of the site of the micronation, macronation. One hectare area of rice field can feeding 100 people around. And 100 people is means that 25 family, mama, papa, and two kids. So uh, there is a housing, there is a cow, chicken, and then pool for the fish, and then a small laboratory to produce the resulting of the field. This is the real uh, example that we uh, built in the two area in the north of Yogyakarta. And this is the schematic of uh, what the farmer can do from uh, fish, rice field itself with the vegetables, and also cow or chicken or uh, other things. And this is the final result that in the name of art, we present of the, this kind of the installation. And the installation itself is not only talking about the aesthetical things, but it's real how to analyze the data from the satellite and how to analyze comparing with the pop how many population in Indonesia, how many uh, rice fields, how many uh, people around uh, outside Java Island, which is the main island in Indonesia, and when the Indonesia will be sustained with the, this system. Potensi ini sih cukup besar karena kita memang satu negara yang basis akunya kuat dan sebetulnya dari, dari dulu kita keluh bahwasanya kita itu kalau hanya sekedar mengandalkan kepada menanam tanah lalu kemudian langsung jual tanpa ada proses nilai tambah itu sebenarnya saya Saya di lahan pertanian itu adalah mengelola jeraminya sebagai bahan utama karena ini menyangkut limbah padi, limbah pangan untuk energi alternatif secara teknologi mikroorganisme yang bisa diandalkan untuk merubah bahan-bahan bubuk kandungan emisi lulusannya bisa sekitar kalau bisa mengolah jerami eh, atau damen ini kan nanti bisa menambah perekonomian nah, kalau bisa ini dijadikan sebagai bahan bakar itu bagus sekali 
Istilah micronation di sini di proyek ini sebenarnya membuat uh, ide yang super besar tadi itu menjadi kecil, misalnya seperti etanol membuat uh, skala laboratorium. Micronation Micronation ini kita bekerja sama dengan komunitas-komunitas pertanian di Cangkringan, komunitas Alkodir, Gandang Garden, dan komunitas Alaram. Di sana kita melakukan uji coba sebuah teknologi pertanian. Kita membuat sebuah model sawah, bagaimana dengan kita menanam padi, kita bisa menghasilkan ikan, kita bisa menghasilkan banyak sekali. Superkomputer digunakan untuk mengolah seluruh data yang di grab dari satelit. Data itu berupa kontur tanah, kecepatan angin, musim, dan seluruh data berupa variabel itu, itu akan diolah di superkomputer ini. Saya ingin mengajak untuk semua melihat hari ini kemampuan kita. And also uh, one good example uh, from Japan uh, last uh, two months ago that I also uh, attend uh, is called Media Art Kitchen Yamaguchi Open Call Laboratory and Exploration into Social Anthropology in Asia. So um, the idea was uh, how to understanding about natural resources in Japan, which is, uh, for example, just small example that why uh, Japan always import all product uh, using bamboo or wood from China, which is, uh, this is contradictive with the situation in, uh, in Japan because Japan have a lot or even overloading for the uh, bamboo and wood. And of course, I understand that uh, how to produce the product inside Japan is more expensive than to import from the other countries. So that's why the, the grow up of the economical uh, system much uh, when they increase uh, better and better, that is not guarantee to have a good system inside the society. And this is some of uh, some picture that I collect uh, from the last project in Yamaguchi in YCAM workshop. We produce uh, some uh, a collaboration also with uh, FabLab Kikatagaya or a lot of artists uh, in the region and doing with children also. And uh, I think it's similar what happened in uh, Southeast Asia, especially in Indonesia, because uh, we have almost 100 million hectare area, and uh, more than 50% from all uh, Indonesia area have uh, deforestation, so which is uh, more than 600 hectare area per year, it's gone. So this is like a data uh, in 2006, 2007, uh, how many wood consumption in Indonesia per year and how much money that we losing from uh, this situation, mafia things or the people that didn't aware or didn't care about the uh, natural resources and the future of the society and just selling and burning and then cutting a wood and then uh, export to other countries for billion US dollar per year. And uh, this is, you can find in internet very easy, um, uh, the prediction in 2020 that uh, Borneo or Kalimantan will be gone. If, uh, it's more than 90%. So uh, I think that uh, yeah, I know this guy since long time, in 2002, when I uh, have a, a residency program in Arkas in Moria, Ibaraki. Um, what I want to do is uh, just to tell that uh, the simple things, meet the simple things, uh, is, will be complicated. It's, 
uh, our experience to do uh, something in the society or mix with many, many people from different backgrounds, for example, that is will be really complicated. It's not easy at all. So it's good uh, that Joy Ito from uh, MIT say that also. And this is one of the best friends of mine. And, uh, Gunalan also always mentioned about uh, why we explore the technology, why are we always trying to do uh, in the better life. What is better life? Because the technology itself uh, is, is us, is, is, uh, is already inside us. Uh, we cannot deny or we cannot uh, make the distance with the technology. It's impossible. So if we uh, start to make a discussion how to deal with the technology, I think uh, I'm not going into the, this kind of discussion because the technology itself is us. So um, I really interesting with uh, Internet of Things now. So um, uh, Rob van Kandenberg also one of the, our advisor for Horn Foundation, and uh, he create a lot of critics and a lot of uh, um, theoretical uh, things about uh, Internet of Things and uh, how it impacts on the society and the city as well. And one, a good example that we did in Taiwan, um, we are not create the artwork or the something with aesthetical things, even inside the gallery or inside the art people, who to, um, who to see or enjoy the artwork itself. But we went to four uh, real laboratory with a real professor who didn't understand at all about the art or media art things. And then uh, we went to the Taichung District Agricultural Research and Extension Station Council of Agriculture. And also, uh, we go to the biotechnology uh, and food science, and also we go to the Department of the Life Science, and uh, those university and the professor invite also uh, many different uh, students to make the uh, same research and then uh, analyze what can and how the way how to present to the public, how the public or the uh, audience can understand what happened in the laboratory. And it is some, uh, some images that I, I collect also. And then in this, uh, in this session that already um, created by a lot of people is not depending on the artist anymore and it's not depending on the art institution anymore, that it's possible to create something, how to explain. So in the way how to explain the technology and the aesthetical things is not depending anymore of the artist and art institution. So everybody can do that. This is the future. This is the future of uh, how we can imagine uh, something like this. So this is the... The next uh, project that we are uh, imagining what is the ideal uh, media art center or media lab uh, in Indonesia. I will make very quick because the time is uh, maybe already over now. So if you look at the workshop uh, of uh, and a workshop uh, during the sales button, you can open the, uh, the website and also uh, Horn Fab Lab, also the new uh, platform for uh, open culture and critical making is called a Prototype. We just produced Prototype this year, and the next year we continue for the Transform Making International Summit on Critical and Transformative Making, and uh, will be in September next year. So um, this is the text that I will make uh, very quick also. So we uh, invite all of you who are interesting, uh, interested with uh, this activity or this collaboration with uh, hackers, 
makers, bricolors, educator, educators, researcher, theorists, artists, even designers from all over the world next year, just uh, let me know or just open the website and uh, we will launch the open call very soon. And then um, I hope that we uh, uh, can continue this discussion or can uh, make the real activities and the real solution for the real problem in the real society. Arigato gozaimasu. I like the costume uh, in your last slides better than the one you're wearing now. But I think you changed your uh, focus of your interest. That's why you changed costume. Just kidding. Um, uh, our, our next speaker, uh, Richard uh, Strammatter Trump, is based in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. And uh, he's a very uh, multifaceted uh, person. And he's an artist, director of PR projects, a uh, curator, writer, as well as a senior lecturer at IMIT University in Ho Chi Minh City. His works are w widely covered and exhibited in Taiwan, China, Japan, and Europe. Uh, his critical work includes uh, writings in The Contemporary, uh, a uh, magazine based out of London, RS from Madrid, and his curatorial work includes Rotterdam Dialogue, Asia Pacific Triennale, The Times Museum, Asian Arts Space. It is befitting that Richard speaks at this session, uh, Arts into the City, as he brings the art form into daily life through writing, through curation, through making, and through spreading good ideas. Let's give it up to Richard Strometer Chang. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm very pleased to share some of my projects and experience with you. Um, I think what, how I'd like to approach this is approach it through um, a very intimate sharing of some of the projects, um, looking at smaller spaces. So we're not looking at large organizations, but looking at individual efforts and individual discussions and see how those play out um, and relate to society um, later. So here are some of the points that I'd like to cover by the end of the presentation. I think I have about 30 slides. Um, artworks as durable records for understanding cultures and civilizations. When we look at civilizations that have passed, there's lots of artifacts that we can explore. But the ones we tend to be attracted to are those artifacts that somehow express culture. So, so ceramics, um, through cave paintings. Art cannot be divorced from human development. It's always been a part of it. It's almost an, a human impulse. Um, and how artists work and the materials they use create a snapshot of the technology and the knowledge that we have at one point. So I'll explain some of the projects which hopefully demonstrate that. Um, artists have always been sort of barometers for issues that exist in society. Their responses to those issues through artworks sort of is like putting your finger in the wind and seeing what temperature it is. And art, like comedy, often has the ability to address very difficult issues things that are difficult in conversation, but through the vehicle of art, we're able to come together in many ways and have sort of a sounding board to bounce these issues off. And that would be my first project that I will be going into. And finally, um, as an artist, I don't make a lot of things that have a lot of monetary value. Um, my individual practice is usually through institutions, and I'm not represented by galleries, so I don't make money off the artwork I create. The important thing for me is to create a conversation through the works. So um, I believe the first project that I'm going to talk about was in Singapore in 2008, and it dealt with one of those very difficult issues, those traumatic issues. 
The issue that it dealt with was an uprising in Myanmar in 2007 among the Buddhist clergy and the students that was later put down quite violently. And the following year in Singapore, um, we created this artwork for the Biennale. The reason why we wanted to create this work in Singapore, because Singapore was the chair of ASEAN at that time period. So it was a focal point for a lot of the issues from the previous year. Now this structure is made out of almost six tons of sugar. It's about maybe 12 feet high or maybe around three meters high. And um, what we wanted to do with the structure um, was to build it in public space. The structure was outside for three months for the entire duration of the Biennale. And over the three months, it eventually melted to nothing. And we wanted this structure to communicate through metaphor the sort of erosion of hope in Myanmar at that time period. And this shows the slow erosion of the structure in the public space over time. Um, I do, I have several different practices. Uh, one of them, I'm an educator, but I'm also the director of a small art space called Dia Projects in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, this project works within an ecology of Ho Chi Minh City, mostly contributing through what we know as artistic research. Um, if you were to take a look at the sort of community of artists and practices in my city, now, all of them emerged after 2006. 2006 was a sort of important time period because it was the first time the city embarked on a very large international Biennale um, level event. And unfortunately, it sort of, it was a big failure. Um, before that time, nobody actually, we all suspected that there would be problems with very large ambitious projects in our city but nobody ever organized an event and sort of tested that hypothesis. Um, and what we found out that after this sort of implosion, that another way of working was to keep things very small. And so all of the different spaces in my city all have their unique personality, their own strengths, and we all work sort of in concert with each other. And we create something big through individual efforts but for now, we're not looking to establish citywide uh, international events. Um, it was started, my space was started in 2010. Um, it's sort of a, I guess one way of talking about my space, it's sort of a matchmaking, dating place for artists and creatives. What we do is we have lots of meetings and conversations and because we have a network, mainly in Southeast Asia and Asia more broadly, we're able to very quickly find out what people are interested in and match them up with other people. And so most of the things that happen in this space are conversations. I also have a residency program, an unofficial residency program, where I have researchers come. So it's not an artist residency. There's not a lot of space. But people that want to come to Southeast Asia and um, have a temporary base of operations to sort of set up during the daytime while I'm teaching, to conduct meetings, and to do research through the library. Um, there's two spaces. Um, DIA Projects is the meetings place, and DIA Studio is the production place. So here is the studio. Um, and I found that one way of getting to know the value of art is by talking to artists directly. And I think that's what we mostly do at this space, to engage the artists in their ideas, their process, to interrogate them as artists are interrogating the issues. And so we have lots of people come in and out. Um, and th these people range from students to architects to urban designers um, and um, people in unrelated art fields. My practice, um, I, my background's in media art. Um, in fact, um, when I was younger, I did undergraduate research at the MIT Media Lab. 
now my practice has uh, I'm very far away from technology. I'm mostly working in uh, natural materials, clay, wood. The library, um, we have over 3,000 books on art, culture, science, and philosophy um, that are available for the visitors. And I think this is probably the most important thing that we can offer the city is this collection of books. In Ho Chi Minh City, we don't really have very strong bookstores. We don't have a Kino Kuniya, for example. So it's very hard to get information. It's very expensive to import it in. So over the past 10 years, I've been bringing different types of books through my suitcase and assembling a collection. What I find valuable about small personal libraries is that if you go to a library, the best thing to do is to just browse and, and not really have an, a, an agenda before, um, an agenda going into the library, but just let yourself wash over the collection. If you use a search engine to find information, you always find what you're looking for. Um, you type in a keyword, you expect sort of a, a response. Um, however, when you go into a library without searching for something specifically, you find things that you're not looking for. You find things, one thing juxtaposed next to another to create new meanings. It reminds me of the U2 song, U2 song I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Well, it, the approach is wrong. You should go in and let sort of the material collide. Uh, somebody mentioned beautiful chaos earlier. That's what a library is, is this something like beautiful chaos. Um, most of the projects that we do um, are speculative in nature, meaning that they don't really have a commercial value. But once in a while, there are some very entrepreneurial people that come through, and they do come up with projects that potentially have value. This is called Helvetica, sort of rubbing off Helvetica, and um, young type designers coming into um, the space and redesigning Helvetica for Vietnamese typesetting. Now, Vietnamese, as you can tell from the diacritics, they have very special demands because they have diacritics on the top and the bottom, which create problems for typesetting. So they're trying to reimagine a way to redesign typefaces, but most importantly, to release, after they design them, to release them open source, because they'd like to see them used on the street. And so here are some students trying to radically redesign some of the um, glyphs for the type. Um, one thing that I'm very interested in is the dialogue between artists and scientists. It's, it's a personal thing. And um, through the past couple of years, we've had a number of investigations, open-ended investigations, into the relation between art and science. One of these is called Vile Rats. Um, I've teamed up with uh, a Vietnamese philosopher and scientist at, currently at the university, uh, City University London, UCL, University of University College London. And she um, and I have worked on a number of projects uh, dealing with the sort of dialogue between art and science. Um, the methodologies obviously are different, the scientific method versus the sort of creative process. But this is really nothing new. Um, if we know from our history that artists or designers have always had a foot in both. Um, we can look at da Vinci, for example. We can also look at scientists that have yet to develop a codified language for explaining what they're doing, resorting to the visual. So Richard Feynman, for example, the physicist, is, very, is known for his Feynman diagrams, which were very controversial when he presented them but they allowed a breakthrough of new knowledge, not contextualized as art, but as science. Um, Galileo didn't have any way of explaining what Saturn looked like, so in his notes, he simply drew it. And even now, we see with more and more complexity and more information available, that the importance of information visualization, to, to make visual complexity. Now, um, there have been many 
different organizations that have been set up um, to deal with some of these complex issues, some of them partnering industry with education or create, creation, such as Xerox PARC, and as you'll find out later, on the MIT Media Lab. And these are sort of reified, or they become something, um, through creating organizations or entities. From my practice as an individual artist, I'm not so much interested in creating organizations, but looking at things more speculatively, throwing questions out, bouncing them off people, and seeing what echo returns. And so it's, it doesn't have sort of a, it's more open-ended, and I'll explain what that is. So this here is a picture, does anybody know what this is? This is the Large Hadron Collider, the most expensive scientific endeavor in human history. And just, in, I believe it was in 2012, it realized what it was made for. It verified the existence of the Higgs boson, which was the last piece in validating the standard model. And the standard model is basically everything that we know about the physical universe. And it was confirmed. Um, and so the, this is a momentous sort of an occasion in, in human development. Several years before that, I was interested in this project, but, I, but as an artist, I, and I can't really explain myself through abstraction through mathematics, so I use the visual. One thing I noticed about this one component about the Large Hadron Collider, it looked like something familiar, and it looked like this. Now, some of you may not know what the Large Hadron Collider is, but some of you may have seen this, or some of you may have this in your home. What I'm very interested in is reconciling ancient knowledge with contemporary sort of scientific breakthrough, breakthroughs. Oops, sorry. Um, and looking how these two things, separated by time, separated by discipline, engage in a conversation. They're, they're asking the same questions, actually. We know from the Large Hadron Collider, what is the nature of reality? What is this asking? Well, in its own language, it's asking the same thing. And if we look very closely at times, they may be asking the same thing in almost the same language. For example, if we look at sort of writings in Taoism, the language is quite paradoxical. Sometimes it'll say that things are always in the state of constant motion. They're always moving. Or things can be at one place in another place at the same time, sort of like the yin and the yang, right? Well, that's exactly how science is, is, is describing the position of electrons. They're always in motion, but you never know where it is, right? So I found that this dialogue between ancient knowledge and contemporary knowledge is something that might be useful. Maybe I don't have the answer for a product, but as a question, maybe it's worth asking. This is something that um, you may have seen in a school book as a child um, from science, uh, in looking at the strata of the Earth. And uh, at the very top, we have the crust. And then as we get down into the mantle, um, we see sort of the pressure increases, and it gets hotter as you get closer to the center of the Earth. But as an artist, I noticed something else. It also looks like, well, let me explain the background. Um, I was doing an exploration of these things called rare earth elements. Rare earth elements are, they're not necessarily rare, they're just hard to process, but they're a certain section of the periodic table of elements that are used for high technology, such as magnets, for example. But what was interesting is China controls over 99% of the world market of rare earth elements. And so I wanted to start thinking about the relationship between art on one hand and as it engages with economies. Oops, three minutes in. And so um, I was looking at an observation that the earth is, very, is, is like cooking beef. Um, medium rare, as in rare earth, as you get it's all about temperature, it's about pressure. Um, and I think somebody mentioned earlier um, 
in passing about molecular gastronomy as sort of a creative output. Okay. Um, this project, um, one way art can be a barometer for testing different, different questions about the environment, how does art and society, this is the sort of subject, interact? And so I, this is a sketch. In here we have a fiberglass housing. Inside I put honeybees. And the honeybees, um, through those tubes, would go in and out of the gallery according to their natural rhythm. So they would leave in the morning and they would come back at night with some pollen. Um, and the speakers would broadcast the drone of the honeybees throughout the um, space. And so um, I went about building it, providing some information on the wall. I love, I love science museums, so it, in that style of education, and filling it with bees, and the bees came in and out of the gallery. Now the sad thing was, this gallery was built in a new development area, and there was questions about how it would affect the ecology of the area, and a lot of bees died during the process. Um, so looking at how art might provide a comment, a very tangible um, comment on how Deve human development affects ecology. Okay, I'm going to skip very quickly. Um, I'm running out of time. One thing that I'm very interested in is color. I mean, most artists are interested in color, but color specifically as sort of benchmarks through time of what we know. So if we go all the way back to the Paleolithic Age, the Stone Age, everything you had, everything you wore, everything you could possibly make with color was restricted to basically four colors. And all those four colors came from dirt. So it was you know, mud, clay, and chalk. And even today, those are the, um, the same, same sort of colors that we use today um, for drawing. So we use sanguine, charcoal, and chalk. And so using these um, elements, uh, with these colors, reflects the state of knowledge that we have on the time. And this morning, while I was reading the paper, and they just awarded the um, Nobel Prize to three Japanese scientists for our discovery of blue LEDs. They already had green, and they already had red. But blue was incredibly hard to create. But the creation of blue set a new benchmark in our, basically, scientific development. Um, and I also read that in Europe, they're thinking about banning cadmium paints now because they have an adverse effect on human health. But even through our color chart, we, we, we don't even have cadmium yet. So the colors that we have at our disposal reflect our technology, our commerce, and our scientific knowledge at any one point in time. Okay, so my practice now, um, I mostly work in traditional materials, even though my background's in media art. Um, I'm using those same materials, the same dirt to create form. This is my studio, so if I'm not drawing, I can, I'm a sculptor, so I can quickly create sculpture. Um, and the Dia Studio is the production space, and I'm at the end. So if anybody has any questions further, I'm happy to answer um, on a one-to-one -one discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Richard Straight Matter Chan. Now we would like to have a panel discussion, and may I ask the panelists to please come up on the stage. Um, thanks for all you three's incredible and informative speeches. And uh, you know, one thing I noticed that all three of you are happen to be based in Southeast Asia, and um, I'd like for each of you to, for example, comment on the area of the work that you heard from your fellow speakers that you thought that you could also contribute to. So, for example, TDC, TCDC has done work with in disaster area and Humph has done a lot of work around the ideas of community, and you personally, uh, Richard, with uh, arts in a, you know, in a um, community as well. So um, 
Um, why, don't, why don't you start, Richard? With me? Yeah. Um, I've known about the Design Center for, for quite a while. In fact, when you had that proposal for responses to the flood, you put that on the internet. And I shared that with my students because I also teach a course on sort of, I call it, recipes for disaster and looking at um, how students can respond to um, disasters in their area. And I encourage them to apply. I know they didn't, but I encourage them to apply for the Design Center. Um, as far as contributing to the work you do, um, I'm ha I don't know if I can contribute any practical knowledge, but the, the sort of speculative nature of what you do and the attitude that you have while doing it, um, I, it just resonates with me. And I've known about your projects for some time. I, I think it's an incredible effort that Humph or uh, Vinza brought together from the community and the wide range spectrum of your projects. So uh, go ahead, uh, Vinza. Yeah, that it was uh, start with uh, only four people in 1999. It was uh, we even didn't have a computer. Yeah, only one, uh, as I remember, is Pentium two or Pentium one or even before, and it's a desktop computer. So we're trying to analyze or we're trying to have a dream. It's not go beyond because if we uh, trying to have a big dream then will be not happen at all in our life at the time because uh, We just have a small places. We just have a small money. So what can we do and then? Uh, the good example um, was uh, We only trying to get people we only trying to introduce uh, the idea to as uh, as many as we can to friends to the family to the university that uh, we study in, or even into the art people or the commercial people. So uh, I think the question is um, what we can do with what we have. This is the main uh, point of uh, if we want to imagine about the future, because the future is not, it's not somewhere else. It's, 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 it's in front of us. The future is, uh, is us itself. The future is the beginning of our life when we are, uh, wake up in the morning that the future is started. And uh, when we are, uh, go to the bed at night, the future is still in, inside us. So uh, it's very difficult to understand. Uh, uh, it's a lot of um, idea, uh, basic on the technology uh, especially, that trying to catch or trying to make a larger picture of the future because uh, the answer is very easy for us. The answer is uh, very simple. So this is maybe uh, why we start with um, some example from the very near neighborhood uh, problems. Yeah. I see. And uh, Kitty? Yes. Um, I mean, both of them did amazing jobs. I mean, with their with their tech technology and, and with your hands, uh, Richard. Um, I think what if I can contribute to both of them? I, I think we as a TTC we develop um, a knowledge uh, back to the foundation of of design is mm -hmm. the understanding of people. I mean, how can we get to know people? How can we get to the depth of their mind? What kind of techniques should be used during the interview, asking or getting to know and, and analyze those in order to really, really understand them? And there are so many things, because at the people level, you're talking about everyone, right? Not even the citizens, not even the, the designers or the experts. You're also talking about the government, too. How can you understand the government? Right. How can you understand the, 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 the needs of those guys mm. in the cabinet, mm. right? I think we got some, some insights, some, some techniques. If you want to, us to share, we're willing to. Uh, is there much uh, collaboration between the three countries that you represent, uh, as far as you know, mm. in terms of uh, design and the uh, city uh, I think not yet. Initiatives. I think, as far as I, I know, not it's yet. It's still early, I think. But, still early. Yeah. But we can start it now, right here, right now. Of course. Right. Yeah. And um, um, the, the, another question I'm interested in asking is, um, obviously, um, 
you represent uh, doing design from a government point of view and helping them facilitate the design dialogue. And uh, Vinza really kind of started from a decentralized way, you know, just just do it attitude and started from community and duplicating, you know, one after another. And Richard kind of examine this, the phenomenon from a personal perspective, from as an artist, as a critic. Um, I wonder, you know, you three coming from three different backgrounds and three different angles are essentially going to the same direction. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder, is there anything that you would, utterly, you, you, would, you would otherwise do differently if you had known each other back then? And obviously, you might have some challenges, you know, when you for example, try to work with government or when you try to apply for grants or something like that. Yeah. So maybe you go first. Of course, I, I would love to interface you guys. I mean, um, because as our organization, I, I didn't tell much, but I'm not having have, uh, enough time. As a TCC, I think not only the TCC, but most of the government's organization, we acting as the, the interface. Mm amongst like all government officials, institutions, and the people, yeah. the citizens, right? We are in the middle. So, and our, our job is not, not many times um, we did things by ourselves, but most of the time we're trying to connect people, connect the government to the locals, government to institution, institution to business, things like that. I mean, I'm willing to, to, to connect you guys, I mean, among us and Thai artists, Thai designers to do projects. Should be fun. I don't know if I would do anything differently, but I, I, by, by this age, I, I know my limitations. Mm. And uh, for me, I know that I work best in sort of one-to-one -one engagements, personal conversations. Mm. I'm actually surprised that I can actually deliver a talk to an audience this big. <laughs> um, pretty good one, too. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think... Um, yeah, I don't know if I would do anything differently, but I know that what I can do and what I do well when I do it, um, I should stick to that. Cool, cool. I think so? I think in my perspective, um, the situation, uh, especially in Indonesia where I live in, um, is quite different because uh, mm. we look like have a system, but we have no system inside. Uh, for example, um, a lot of my friends and even me, uh, effort didn't have a uh, identity card, and it's uh, mm. expired since long. Mm. So it's I no um, no difficulties how to um, enjoy life or no mm. difficulties go to the make some official letter. And until now, I can uh, go everywhere mm. without uh, have uh, <coughs> a real uh, identity card from the government. So. It means that uh, the nation with the database is quite dangerous and quite um, is uh, it's kind of like an immortal uh, idea in this planet to have uh, some country or as a nation uh, who didn't have a database for uh, the system of the citizenship. So um, for me. Um, until now, I never believed in the calculation of the population, for example. And now, uh, some data say that uh, 240 million population. Mm. And uh, some data also uh, say that 265 million population. Mm. And where is the data come from? Where is the data going into the, some website or some NGO or some uh, official institution for the government? So if we look at uh, all the analogy of the system inside us uh, as a person or as the small group, a small community, or even a big uh, institution that we live in, that we uh, enjoy life every day, that we are working on. And uh, of course, uh, we always connect with this kind of system. So it's, uh, we have to be careful with uh, when we're talking uh, pretty much about uh, some uh, chronology of the system, how the system create, how the system uh, can be sustained, how the system can be uh, engaged with the society, and how the system itself can be uh, more, give a better or better life for, the, uh, for us. 
So this is uh, my perspective of uh, my uh, our condition. We have a few minutes left, so I'd like to uh, open the question to the floor. And um, please raise your hands if you have any questions. There's one question right here. Richard, please. Thank you. Hi, Venha. Uh, this, this is more towards you, for you. Um, absolutely not confrontational or seeking any, any, any more difficult um, exchange. I'm also living in a, in a, in a country that is um, pretty much rule from the top down. Um, the question is, sometimes trust comes both ways. Um, if we don't give much trust to the government, the, trust, the government won't give you much trust back. And I think in the area of culture, creative, design, there's still a lot of room to go without being confrontational. Um, I, I want to hear from you a little bit. Um, do you go back and forth from the two sides that it has to be somehow um, anti-establishment or uh, government conversation dialogue? Or can you, can you sometimes remove yourself from that and get your citizens to be active citizens and go for positive exchange dialogue? Yeah, it's a good question also, because uh, since 1999, that is uh, near, it's impossible for us to get the money or to get the uh, funding uh, from the local government or uh, inside the Indonesia companies, because uh, it's difficult for us to, how to explain. Even how to explain is difficult. And uh, how we can go to the next level, how to produce something, and how we can go to the next, next level how to enjoy the product for the idea. So this is a long story and uh, it's, as I mentioned before, that it's not easy at all to the, for the start, but related with the question is also uh, around 2005 and six, we decided to uh, have a new spirit to invite people from outside Indonesia because at the time uh, we can connect with uh, a lot of network and uh, we just knew that uh, we don't need money. With zero money we can invite a lot of experts and uh, with zero money we can invite uh, a lot of crazy people outside Indonesia to come and uh, make a real collaboration with us. This is the uh, important point of the Honf story. And then, uh, for example, that uh, we create some new platform also. This is also part of the story. Uh, after the, uh, the, 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 the smartphone uh, was founded, because uh, we don't need to make the discussion anymore what is the word. The word is in our hand, because we can create many things in the same time. So we can uh, my friend in Indonesia now hear me talking like this in the same second, or even just delay one or two seconds, and uh, with a lot of uh, smart devices. So means that how to create the connection between the community and com another community, uh, or community with the local government, or community with the next uh, generation, which is will be more and more smart. And uh, this is also that we want to create uh, something related with the activity itself. So that's why I mentioned before that the answer for the future is just to do uh, the best thing and uh, based on what we have. Because uh, we cannot have a dream, we cannot have a future or imagine the future uh, based on something that we cannot have it on hand. Because uh, we really need something real in front of our eyes. And uh, the future is maybe become in the next morning or, or, over f or another individual or another person that uh, probably have another dream or another destination. So we cannot make the possibilities in the same level. The level is always, always, always different. And the, the meaning of the dream also 
is quite uh, very large of the uh, our what we can imagine. Uh, it's like uh, the analogic of the Large Hadron Collider uh, that he mentioned before, uh, the most expensive for project in technology right now in Europe. So uh, that for us is uh, we can do something like that even in Southeast Asia, even in the small, small village. It's depending on the idea, depending on how much the spirit that we can keep and depending on the destination uh, where we have to go. So, I think. Thank you, Vinza. And with this insightful comments, we've reached the end of today's uh, conference. And thank you, Richard. Thank you, Vinza. Thank you, Kitty, for a wonderful session. And most of all, uh, thanks to all your participation throughout the day. And. Uh, Thank you, Nanjusang, and all the partners and uh, all the wonderful um, sponsors and uh, uh, speakers. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Jason Su, thank you very much, Mr. Jason Su, and thank you, uh, Mr. Kitty Ratana, Mr. Venza, and uh, Richard. A strike mark at Trump. Now we would like to have a summary and we will arrange, rearrange the stage. So if you could bear with us for a few moments. Thank you. Thank you for waiting, ladies and gentlemen. We would now like to go into the summary head of part. And may I call upon her Dr. Atinan, please? And uh, also her Mr. Hadegunaran, uh, from uh, the, uh, the, the Penny W. Stamps of Art and Design at the University of Michigan, and also her director, Nanjo, please, from Mori Museum. Thank you. We have only half an hour for the summary part. We have heard such diverse views and speeches. I think summary is quite impossible thing to do. But uh, if I could uh, uh, share it with you and also ask uh, Mr. Gunaran as well as Dr. Apinan to share with us a few points of uh, uh, which they have uh, taken interest. And I would also like to ask uh, uh, the other panelists also to give comments. But uh, uh, before doing so, may I start from Mr. Gunaran and Dr. Apinan. Mr. Gunaran, would you like to start? Could you share with us uh, your comments? Uh, there are several things I, I, I noticed that I thought would be useful for us to uh, think about and take it to the next few days. Um, the, the tension, uh, so there are several kind of, uh, they could be described as tensions. Tensions between uh, two things that are going on uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, the, the, the today's panel. One is the tension between a top-down government or commercial, uh, commercially driven uh, initiative and the bottom-up uh, efforts by the community and individuals to make something happen. Uh, what is better? Uh, what works better? Uh, why is one working better in one society than another? That, that seems to be one of the themes that I noticed in the presentations today. Uh, the second is the question of, um, uh, you know, how do we think about the tension between technology and the arts, um, especially as it relates to the, sit the city? Um, there were several people who talked about, uh, including myself, who talked about the importance of technology that is um, um, uh, playing um, uh, the, a second, secondary role to the arts. Uh, and then there were others who were saying, look, you know, it was difficult because um, 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 the technology was the one that was interesting and important, and the technology drove what 
was artistically uh, the experience. The, the, the third question, not so much attention, but the third question that I, I saw happening throughout is the question of uh, sustainability, meaning, yes, we can do this today, uh, but what is the impact of what we are doing today uh, in the long run? How long can we do what we are doing? Uh, when do we run out of resources? When do we run out of opportunities to do more? Uh, when do we run out of support from the community or from the government or from people below? Uh, so uh, that was the other big thing that I thought was going on throughout the, uh, the talks today. Uh, I, I, I personally don't, don't think that the first two, the tensions between technology and the arts, or the tensions between um, top-down or bottom-up uh, can be resolved. Uh, it looks to me like in every case, in every culture, in every society, depending on the political systems, the way in which they look at the arts, the way they think about what, how important a city is, uh, uh, how they think about uh, innovation and development, uh, it will change. Um, um, but I think the sustainability question is an important one, and I hope that whatever we are doing, we, can, we will continue to think about whether we can do this for a long time to come. And, and think about the impact that we are having uh, by what we do uh, in the long run. So. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very good point that you've made, uh, the bottom-up uh, and the top-down uh, approach. Uh, on that uh, point, from the standpoint of city building, in the ultimate end, uh, to what end you give uh, people freedom to do what they want to do. And uh, if people do what they want, uh, you can have a city as a result of that. Then uh, another approach is where you have a strong uh, city uh, government, uh, and then they uh, draw up a, a city planning uh, plan, and uh, they control a vast area, which is better. And uh, oftentimes we talk about uh, this. I'm not uh, trying to forecast what's coming up tomorrow, but uh, that uh, is uh, coming up as a subject uh, tomorrow. So if you're interested, please do come tomorrow. That uh, perspective is also uh, always existing when it comes to uh, city matters. Uh, uh, Cole House has uh, talked about uh, this uh, very interesting uh, point. Uh, the uh, democratic government uh, is uh, only capable of or, or uh, only needs to create infrastructure. Uh, roads and uh, water and uh, sewers uh, and uh, power and information infrastructure that's all they do and uh, they they, sh they we should leave the rest to the private sector uh, chaos and infrastructure standing side by side that's the only way possible that's what the call has says and uh, on art and technology uh, this is uh, a, uh, a tension which is often cited as well uh, and uh, this is often uh, mentioned uh, when we discuss uh, technology and art. Uh, originally, technology and uh, art were not uh, opposing. Uh, they were one. Uh, techne in uh, Greek uh, uh, points to both, both art and technology. Uh, however, in this day and age, uh, art and technology has been divided. Uh, so originally, it was just one concept uh, within the European civilization. Uh, there, that is how they say it. Uh, technology and art may not be con confrontational. They're not. They may not be a tension between the two. That may be one uh, way of looking at it. Uh, 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 Dr. Appenen, please. Um, I must say that uh, the, the whole day has been most exhilarating and full of surprises. Uh, I must say that uh, my expectations of the speakers uh, were going to be uh, the emulation of uh, various innovative or creative cities around the world, whether it be uh, Bilbao or Liverpool or London, whereby uh, the word regeneration of certain uh, forgotten areas or derelict areas have been uh, revived to, to make cities become creative, creative cities. But today, 
there was no one mention of regeneration, which I'm, I'm very glad to hear. Uh, I'm very surprised and, and most happy to hear also of, of the way the way the speakers uh, tackle each, each session. You know, the, um, in 1994, I was in similar uh, forum like this, organized by the Japan Foundation. And in that forum, I was with uh, very young Tatsuo Miyajima, who was using technology to uh, create his works, and Chai Kuo Shang, who was using gunpowder to create his works. Those were the years of uh, young thinkers. And later on, I, I met uh, now very good friends, uh, artists such as Harry Dono, uh, Dadan Cristanto, uh, Awindria Milo, and many others. But you see, in, in Southeast Asia, there, there is this notion of uh, a distance between uh, craftsmanship and technology. An artist like Harry Dono became uh, a low-tech, low-tech genius. You know, his works, you, you might get electric shock by, you know, <laughs> looking at his work or touching his works, and that's the beauty of it. You know, and, and, and the way, the way um, Richard or Venza were talking uh, are very, very uh, experimental and, and very subversive, which I think that uh, it reminds me of the the zeitgeist of, of, of the age and the, and the way the artists look at things and, and solve problems. Uh, I, I feel that um, the, the thinking whereby um, creating space, where whether Gandhi or Kitirat uh, try to show uh, how communities and the government uh, want to create certain areas within the city. So they become cities within cities, whereby the enormity enormity of mega city like Bangkok can be tackled uh, in, in corners, in, in places. So these kind of uh, strong communities uh, emerging due to the fact of the lack of, lack of infrastructure by the government. Uh, tomorrow I'll be talking about uh, creative chaos. And you know, many cities, uh, not just in Southeast Asia, but in, in Asia, you know, whether it be uh, Mumbai or uh, Banares or Calcutta, it's, it's full of chaos and, and the ability to survive. You know, these are ancient cities going back hundreds of years. And in those days, there were no high technology. Even now, they don't use so much high technology. But uh, I was fascinated by uh, the, the presentation uh, by uh, Inoko-san and uh, Mizuguchi-san, whereby Japanese artists have, have, I call them craftsmen, you know? The ability to use high-tech as craftsmanship. And it goes back to the using of the hands also. You know, don't think these artists don't use the hands, you know, but they use it in such a way. And, and the head and the hand collide in very creative ways. Like in the olden days where uh, Hukusai or other artists use the head and hands to present their ideas. So, uh, like the idea of uh, you know, the Olympics, you know, the future, how, how are we going to tackle uh, the year when uh, Japan is going to be host of the Olympics, but through art. You know, I, I recall very much uh, in, at TCDC where uh, Edward Barber came the other week, and he, he was the designer of the, of the torch, of the Olympic torch, and how it became the symbols of how the creation of the torch uh, is spread worldwide, and each torch is different uh, at each Olympics. So in that way, technology and art uh, really can merge. But when art comes out, comes out of the white cube, when it comes out of the gallery, uh, to the audience, to the public, you know, I feel that's, that's, where, that's where it's at, whether it be at entertainment or whether it be aesthetics. You know, I was thinking of uh, Niigata, Prefecture Niigata in uh, Eshiko Sumari Trinale, or I'm thinking of the uh, Fere Tash uh, Tashikawa, where you know the area where the urban area has been transformed by artworks, or even the Benese. Uh, Fumio san invited me one time to to Benese, and how the island became revived, you know, through through art activities. This is the idea I think where 
creative cities or innovative cities become, become such because creative people in those cities make them. So I feel, you know, today is like full of colliding ideas whereby they don't have to be resolved. Each speaker presents their own problems with their, with their own theories because they come from various nodal points of the world. But we can sense that, uh, for example, today we are fo focusing on Southeast Asia. Uh, next year we know that it's going to be an uh, ASEAN uh, community whereby the, the 10 ASEAN countries will be merged or created as one. But, but that's impossible anyway, because each ASEAN country has its own, its own uh, idiosyncrasies, its own uh, characteristics, its own uh, flavor. But we must keep this through art. And, and the differences, uh, I feel that whether in Yogyakarta or whether in uh, Manila or, or Singapore or Chiang Mai, they, they need to be uh, kept intact. The other thing I, I, I like to, to also uh, interject here is uh, those who live outside cities. There was mention of neighbors. Eh? But in the provinces, they also need to be considered because these people, uh, we know this migration of people into the mega city. This is sucking and drawing. It's almost cannibalistic, whereby the cities actually eat, you know, the areas around them. These, these ideas of people in the provinces, you know, how, how do they deal with art, aesthetics, technology? So I feel that uh, we, we need to uh, have some space for them also. And, and artists and creative thinkers may, may want to run out of the cities into the provinces as a ut utopian uh, search or as uh, somewhere where they want to uh, have more space to create works. Uh, and the Land Foundation in Chiang Mai is, is one uh, example. Uh, I also like uh, Richard's, Richard's uh, where's Richard? Oh, okay, I like, I, like, I like Richard's idea uh, when he said that um, Maybe doing biennales in Southeast Asia be, became too, too challenging, you know. Uh, but you learn from that, you know, e even though the one in, in Ho Chi Minh did not work, but you learn from that. And I feel like uh, people ask, why not have Bangkok Biennale? Because uh, uh, maybe we're not ready for it or we're not stable enough to plan because to do biennales or triennales, you have to plan for, for one decade, you know. But you can do other things, you know, individual things whereby creativity can, can give a lot of uh, opening up where people can, can learn and be educated and, and feel that they're not estranged. You know, a lot of people feel estranged about art or aesthetics, even technology or science, but how can they feel comfortable? Uh, so so the, the hologram uh, that has been created at Singapore Biennale is maybe one answer where people, you know, if it goes public and people can interact with it, or even the games, they can play to the point where, you know, we love games, you know. Uh, today we have the mobile and, and it's a game, you know. So I think, okay. <laughs> if I may uh, interject at this point. This morning, we did a uh, questionnaire survey and uh, towards the end, in uh, the late afternoon, we said we'd do it. So we'd like to do that, actually. Uh, will it uh, be shown uh, on the screen? Now, could we do this once again, uh, all over again? Should art have more presence uh, in the city? The first time around, uh, a lot of people said yes. But we'd like to see if uh, there's going to be a difference. Not much change. Going to the next question, the second question. Uh, we'll, we've attached two different questions. Will art using technology develop more in the future? Uh, by far, there's uh, far more yeses than no. Is progress necessary for culture? How'd it go? 
There are those uh, several who have said no, somewhat. And next question. And this was a topic which uh, came up during our discussions uh, today. Um, art is something that you participate in. It's not something that you look at. Uh, there was uh, such a view. And uh, I'd like to advertise uh, that the exhibition at the Mori uh, Art Museum uh, um, is uh, so, such a, an exhibition. It's a participatory uh, art uh, by a Taiwanese uh, uh, artist. So uh, could you answer this question? Uh, participating in artwork is better than just looking at it. It's, um, it's a, a lot of trouble to try to participate. One, some people feel lazy about it. Some, uh, there's a, lot of, a few who have said, I don't know. And what about the results? Some people feel that it's just OK just to look at things. And then there are people who don't understand the meaning of having to participate, perhaps. Please uh, think about the significance of uh, participatory art. Next question. This here again. In uh, Asia, uh, this uh, comes up uh, quite often as a subject of discussion uh, for, uh, to, for the development of the city. It's in, unavoidable to demolish the old city. How about uh, this one? No. Uh, we have uh, that many no's. Taiwan has uh, a lot of no's. Uh, in terms of view. But then uh, there are cities where you have to leave uh, the old city, where you must. And then there are cities uh, where it doesn't look like you, you should keep the old uh, city. Um, it's a very thought-provoking uh, result. Any comments uh, from the other speakers? I'm not very surprised that I'm not very surprised that people are, uh, are feeling a little bit uh, with question five uh, about the old city and improvements in a, to better the city. I think that um, uh, that's one of the tensions that um, has been around for a while, you know. How do you build, how do you, how do you develop a city? Do you spread it out or do you, do you concentrate and, and take things that are already there and, and make it? Uh, if you look at many cities, they have three or four cities. So if you look at New Delhi, it has seven cities. Uh, New Delhi is seven different cities together because they have never really destroyed any of the old cities. Um, Istanbul, I think, is three or four cities. Um, if you look at many Southeast Asian cities, uh, a lot of the old cities um, have actually erased. If you, for example, Singapore. Um, they started with uh, this uh, idea that everything will be erased and then you will start all over again. Um, so um, I think it's, these are what you call developmental choices and it's great to hear that at least in, um, in this city there are a good number of people who care about keeping the old city as it is. In Japan, there are many methods of uh, the architecture to try to preserve the outer the walls, but the changing everything inside. Uh, this is something of an acrobatic nature, but that is done. What I have felt during the discussion today is, as uh, Mr. Gunaran has said, is there are many tensions, and also technology and art and history and progress. We are living amidst all these elements. How can we create a better city? If I may go back to the original theme, 20 years from now, what will happen to the cities? What will be our livelihoods? What will become of our culture? These are the things I hope that you will be able to duly think of and participate in the discussion from tomorrow. I believe we have arrived at the time to end our session. Thank you very much for bearing with us for many hours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Apinan, Mr. Gunaran, and Mr. Nanjo. Thank you very much. Once again, a big applause for the speakers. Thank you.